Are you ready to take your moving company to the next level? Then you won't want to miss the Grow Your Moving Company workshop hosted by Move It Pro. This two-day event is packed with insights, strategies, and tips on how to streamline your operations, maximize your profits, and take your business to new heights. At the Grow Your Moving Company workshop, you'll hear from experts who have been in your shoes and know what it takes to succeed in this competitive industry. You'll get insider knowledge on how to generate leads, close more deals, and build a brand that sets you apart from the rest. So don't wait. Head over to growworkshop.moveitpro.com to register for the event today. That's growworkshop.moveitpro.com. We'll see you there. Welcome to the Moving Company Owners Podcast, where we dive deep into the world of moving companies and the people who make them run. From industry leaders to successful moving company owners, we explore their stories, strategies, and insights to help you grow your business and take it to the next level. Whether you're just starting out or a seasoned veteran, this is the podcast for you. So sit back, relax, and get ready to move your business forward with your host, Jason Berginski. Hey guys, Jason Berginski here from the Moving Company Owners Podcast. Today we have the founder of Pink Zebra Moving, Ron Holt. Um, thanks for being on, on the show today, Ron. Man, I'm glad to be here, Jason. Thanks for having me. Perfect. So, uh, you know, the big thing is typically what we do to start these off is kind of learn a little bit about your company, a little bit about your history, and try and um, show the, the viewers, you know, a little bit about your, your world and how you got into this. So I'll kind of let you start off and Tell us a little bit about yourself and what found you uh, starting a moving company called Pink Zebra Moving. Yeah, so I kind of came into this industry through the back door. Um, I was in the cleaning industry for a very long time, almost 20 years. For 19 years, I built a home service brand, a house cleaning brand called Two Maids and a Mop from one location to almost 100 locations across the country before selling it just a couple of years ago. So I have a lot of home service experience eventually became well uh, knowledgeable in the franchise space, went through all the ups and downs every entrepreneur goes through when they build something from nothing and eventually made it to the mountaintop, you know, sort of lived the American kind of dream come true and should have been happy. But there was this moment of reflection toward the end of that 19 year sort of journey where I felt something missing. You know, I had thousands of employees across the country, uh, again, 93 locations uh, from California to Florida and should have been happy, but whatever it was, was missing inside of me. I was trying to find. And I, when I looked in the mirror, what I saw was corporate America and I started a business mainly to get away from that. And so I wanted to figure out a way to either change that culture inside the business or start fresh, but I didn't know what starting fresh was going to look like. And so I love home services and I've been searching across different industries, you, you name it, and just nothing really excited me until one day, um, I guess now about three years ago, my mother-in-law right here in our hometown of Birmingham, Alabama, hired a moving company. And, you know, you, you talk to moving companies all the time. You know all the crazy stuff that happens out there <laughs> and all the crazy stuff happened to her. Yeah. You know? So oh. um, when all of that went down, it made me sort of think, well, maybe there's an opportunity here. Maybe there's something disruptable even, you know? And so I started searching across the country for other markets to see what type of literally just negative reviews were occurring and all the negative things that happened with my mother-in-law were happening for people in other markets from Seattle to Omaha to Miami, you know, just a wide swath of this country. And that's when the light bulb hit me that maybe this is my opportunity. I can sell my baby turned adult two maids in a mop business into, uh, you know, take some chips off the table and then start fresh with a brand new business opportunity. And so that's what I did. I went all in on the moving industry, didn't know one thing about it, didn't know what H dollies were and all those things. And so I had to learn all that, but I enjoyed every second of it, you know, cause it was all just building a business model with a blank canvas. And so I didn't have any industry bias. I didn't have any, failures to reflect on everything was in front of me and so for a while there that's what we did was just really throw things against the wall to see how they would you know work or not and so that's that's kind of how i got into this industry i came from a consumer perspective more than a business perspective uh, which is why a lot of the things that we do today are so pro-consumer based sure and so tell me a little bit about this so the company you had before that you built to almost 100 locations 
were those all corporately owned locations or you had started doing franchising with that as well? What, what kind of did that look like? Yeah, initially that's all we did. We opened 12 Two Maids and a Mop corporate locations. That was fine, um, but at a certain point we sort of outstripped our corporate structure. We just couldn't support that much larger growth than that. And so I wanted to keep growing and I had to either build a stronger infrastructure at the home office level, or I had to grow a different way. And franchising became the, the choice that we made. It allowed us to go from 12 locations to again, almost a hundred. And we had at the, toward the end, we only owned one corporate location, which was in Birmingham, our hometown. Mm-hmm. Uh, all the others were franchised. And so I had to learn everything about franchising. <laughs> Interestingly, a lot of people don't really understand this until you live it, but franchising a brand in the home service space versus owning a home service based business are two different things. And so we had to learn how to be a good franchisor training, support, coaching, consulting, all those things were things that we didn't really have to worry about when we just owned the cleaning businesses, you know? And so we had to get better at that and on the fly because we were learning with our franchisees, but it was, uh, it all worked out, obviously, you know, we, we ended in a, in a great way and, all that experience and education we're taking with us now here at Pink Zebra Moving and hopefully avoiding those mistakes uh, like we did before. For sure. And so now, so Pink Zebra opened uh, about two and a half years ago, I think you said. So that was, is that during COVID or that was right after towards the end part of COVID? I it guess was uh, right during. in the thick of it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we, it. We, op- we opened on April Fool's Day in 2021. Yep. Um, so we were, I guess, not necessarily in the thick of it, but we were sure, still right. high time. Yeah, uh, we we saw an opportunity. You know, we weren't necessarily trying to take over the world when we opened yep. our initial corporate location. We just wanted to get our feet wet. We wanted to know what it meant to stack a truck and what it meant to buy a truck or lease a truck, and you know, all the things that happen with mm-hmm. trucks. You know, as, as you're maintaining them, and we we wanted to learn how to hire people and what it is going to take to motivate them to to stay hired and. All of those things were more important to us than driving revenue. Now, eventually, at some point, late, you know, during that year, we had to get more serious about driving revenue, because for us to franchise a business model, you got to have a profitable, scalable sure. business model. And so, early on, though, it was just getting our feet wet. We we were learning on the go, and I'm sure the April Fool's Day customers back then don't agree that we're we're a great movie company today. Um, but we had, we had to start somewhere. We we toyed with the idea of actually purchasing moving companies that were independent and converting that into a franchisable model. But at the end of the day, I'm a startup guy and I just, I wanted the crazy pains and headaches that come from starting something from scratch. Sure. And, and so how many locations are you looking at now that, that you guys have? Yeah. So we're in 10 locations across the country. Uh, we just most recently ventured outside of the Southeast, all the growth early on just organically kind of grew from the Southeast because that's where our home base is. Uh, we're in Denver, Colorado, um, Oklahoma City, several locations across the Southeast, about to open in, in Jersey and Atlanta as well. So it's it's been a good run. Uh, we expect to somewhere around four to eight new locations per year uh, going forward. Yep. And that's ambitious. So two and a half years you've been open and, and already at 10 locations, which is awesome. And so out of those 10 locations, I think you said earlier, you, uh, you guys uh, opened the original one and then you had sold nine, nine franchises. Correct. Yeah. So we actually don't own the corporate location in Birmingham any longer. Uh, we, like I said earlier, franchising and moving are, we share the same brand name, but we're two totally different businesses. So it's very difficult to be good at both. We learned that, you know, from our days at two maids, but we pretty quickly after we started franchising, sold the local rights to a, a franchise group here in town. And so we are not in the moving business sort of anymore because we're just sure. franchising. But obviously we we help people get open and we help them grow, you know, become profitable and all that. So yeah, we are all franchised now. Um, it's pretty it's a pretty exciting time. You know, I, I know there's a sure. lot of uh, mystery and fear over high interest rates and the real estate market that comes, yeah. you know, the impact from that. But for us, it's high flying. You know, we we have um, really cool marketing strategies that, and, and even sales strategies that really work to get the jobs on the books. And uh, our customer experience model that really separates us from the pack is is what drives a lot of the decisions from our consumers. And so we're growing fast, um, even in the face of all this headwinds that we're all facing. Sure. 
Well, that's perfect. And and I definitely want to hit on in, in a little bit, we'll come back to as far as the model that the customers are seeing and stuff like that. So the franchisees that you're finding or they're finding you, I guess, what, what do the majority of those look like? Are they um, young movers that used to be movers and wanting to get into their own business? Are they, what, what, what's, what are you seeing or what trend are you seeing of the people that are coming to you? Yeah. Franchising in general, you, you don't have a lot of trades people turn franchise owners. Now trades people think franchising is like this nasty word even, you know, so I saw that in, now in both fields. So all of our franchisees, much like a two mates are all white collar executives, sure. you know, either they're continuing their corporate America job or they're retiring from that and focusing 100% on pink zebra moving, but no one knows anything about moving other than just maybe they've hired a moving company in the past, but they don't have any practical knowledge of this industry. That's our job is to teach them teach how them. to move and how to use software and you know, what sure. profit margins mean and, and so forth. And so we, uh, we bring people that are used to working behind a desk and put them in a blue collar industry like moving and make them successful. That's the essence of franchising. That's great. And then, so, uh, as far as size currently about how many trucks are you guys running? So we, so for the most part, most of our franchises are less than a year old, other than obviously the one here sure. in Birmingham. Um, so all of those are anywhere from six to nine months old. Everyone has two trucks right now, two 26 foot, uh, long trucks. And yep. so that will continue to grow. We actually have an internal policy that no one adds their fleet until 12 months in. Uh, we want people to just focus on those two trucks to begin with. People get real excited in the summer, as you probably know. And sure. we learned last summer to slow that roll because winter's coming, you know? And so we, we, uh, we limit growth to just two trucks. We let you go crazy after month 12. Sure. Yeah. And that's, and that's smart. And I will tell you, um, I don't know how much, you know, my history and stuff like that, but you know, uh, I used to own a moving company with my grand or with my, with my father, which was opened by my grandparents, my grandma and my grandpa, uh, back in the sixties, they had opened it. I took it over back in, in the mid to late two thousands. Anyways, during the original recession in 2005, six, seven, right in that range, moving companies, when homes were selling like crazy, they were booming and moving company owners were making so much money. They didn't know what to do with it. And, and I'm not even joking. Like it was because people were buying a house for a hundred grand and selling it for 300 grand a year later. So everyone was hiring movers because they had sure. just made so much money. And we literally, as soon as it all collapsed, we watched probably half of our competition go out of business because they had, during that time that was so hot, went out and bought tons of new trucks, brand new, brand new buildings, brand new facilities, brand, uh, brand new everything. Yeah. And then when the economy collapsed um, and then winter hits and all these other things, now they've got you know, 50, 60, $70,000 a month for a small location and expenses for trucks parked out in the parking lot that they can't move because there's no jobs. Um, and so that's, yeah. it's a very smart thing that you're doing there by holding them back in the first, first year, because they really need to understand. And I'm not talking about necessarily uh, recession and stuff like that in this instance, but they need to understand what changes in the winter time, because the winter time does change a lot um, as far as how busy you are, the needs of people moving, um, and it makes a big difference. And if they think that it's going to be year round, how it is in the summertime, they're going to be frustrated when, when it's not, and they've invested a bunch more money in, in trying to grow the company and, and it's not there in the winter. Right. Yeah. Our saying here, I don't know, we, others may say it as well, but the world's worst moving company is busy in July and the world's best moving company is busy in January. You know, so yep. we, yep. we want you to live through January first. Exactly. <laughs> That's good. So, so now kind of back to the differentiator of, of pink zebra versus other moving companies. And that talks a lot about what your customers are seeing, feeling, um, what makes the difference of why you feel like customers should be using pink zebra over a, a different franchise or a different independent moving company, as far as what you guys provide and, and you know, what the customer gets out of a move. Well, it's probably a combination of two things. Um, the first, probably the least sexy thing about us is just sales and marketing. Uh, we do all of that for our franchisees. We have either our internal people or vendors that they outsource with. 
to make the sales and marketing process super easy. You don't need to know what SEO means. You don't need to know what PPC stands for. Uh, we have people who run those campaigns for you and just make the phones ring. Uh, we have a, a virtual call center with agents that are dedicated to our brand who answer the calls for everyone 24 seven. And so you're not gonna have to hire the world's best salesperson. Uh, that's our job. And so we, um, we, do, we provide that type of infrastructure so you really can just focus on leading leading your people and making sure that the job's done right. Again, that's probably the least sexy thing. A lot of people say that, um, but we really take a lot of pride in that. Sure. The second thing is what we are probably known for the most. Our tagline is we make moving fun. That may sound like an oxymoron to most people, but we, we truly believe we can make it a fun experience. And so we put on a show. We think moving is actually theater. Uh, we do all sorts of fun things and antics throughout the move to actually try to create a joyful experience and so we have we're known for crazy stuff like after a walk through we'll do an exercise routine you know we'll do push-ups or jumping jacks or running in place whatever thing the movers want to do last sure. three or four minutes it's not long but it's funny and it gets the day started right um, we play music throughout every room of the house you know, like fun sing-along songs everybody knows um, you know our trucks are crazy and wild we have a mascot that shows up to almost every move. If there's kids involved, they absolutely, he absolutely shows up. His name is Zeke. Um, we leave surprises behind. Um, you know, after the trucks leave, there's a fun surprise or two somewhere around the house, usually a personalized type gift. If you're a big football fan of whatever team, you know, we try to figure that out and maybe use that to our advantage. And so uh, we obviously move, you know, and we do all the things a moving company does and we got to do that good or otherwise the silly gifts and push-ups don't matter, you know, but we try to combine those things with a great moving, uh, great moving experience to uh, make moving fun. And so yeah. we tell that to our pot potential customers. We put on the show and we get word of mouth referrals because of that. Realtors love us because we're yeah. unique and different. You know, they, they've never heard of something like this before, you know, so we, when we're in front of a realtor and we tell them all the fun things that we do, they usually can reflect on a bad experience they've had with a, another moving company that they've referred. And, uh, you know, we're kind of a clear, obvious choice in, in most of those cases. And so that's, that's our stick. That's what we enjoy doing. You know, we, when we first set out to create this model, we wanted to be sort of the opposite of this industry. Nothing's wrong with this industry. I, I love the people in it. People work their tail off nope. and you know, should be proud of the work they do. But at the same time, very little change or innovation has occurred in this industry yeah. for 50 years, you know? And so um, we are choosing to use the good old fashioned customer service as the way to the top. And as normal as that sounds, it's, it's an angle that hasn't really been attacked within this industry for again, a long time. So um, customers seem to be receptive to it. And realtors sure. seem to be receptive to it. You know, franchisees are making decisions to use life savings to, invest in our business model and, and so far so good. Attention moving company owners. Are you tired of managing your business with spreadsheets and pen and paper methods? Do you want to streamline your operations, increase your bookings and look more professional to your customers? Then it's time to switch to move it pro software. Our cloud-based platform provides everything you need to manage your moving company in one place from booking and dispatching to payment processing and customer communication. Plus, with features like GPS tracking, real-time notifications, and detailed reporting, you'll be able to optimize your operations and take your business to the next level. So what are you waiting for? Visit www.moveitpro.com to schedule a free demo today and see how we can help you move your business forward. That's super neat. It's funny as you bring up that the movers will do a dance and stuff. It reminds me of, uh, I don't know if you guys have them there, but we have Johnny Rockets here which is a burger joint. And it's so funny because every time you're eating a burger and you're in there it, like every 30 minutes or something, a song will come on and then all the waiters and uh, even the grill staff comes out and dances out in the, in the main. So it's interesting, isn't it? but it's super uh, like you're saying, it's that's fun. And that's um, takes the edge off for people that are definitely, you know, moving is one of the three most stressful days in most people's lives. Um, and then being well, able to, you know, do yeah, it, awesome. in my opinion, it, at the end of the day, customers don't know they need these things. You know, with yeah. every customer, if you said, hey, would you like to hire a moving company that makes moving fun? 
or anyone else. And they would go, I don't know, who's going to show up and do it for an affordable rate? That's who I sure. want. Um, so why, do, why are we doing all these crazy things? We're, we choose to do those things. I mean, it's fun. It's, you know, why not sure. be, have fun with it? But really what we're trying to do is build a relationship. You know, yeah. I believe if you really break this industry down into one central issue, it's that most of the jobs are transactional. There's no relationship with the customers. Customers oftentimes don't even know the name of the company they've hired, much less the movers themselves. And, you know, all of a sudden the whole day happens, you get the money and you take off. Well, the customer is now judging you on manual labor, which people are people. You know, we make mistakes. We're going to break things. We're going to scratch walls. We're going to be late. You know, stuff's going to happen. And so when you've got a two, three, four, maybe five plus thousand dollar transaction and you're viewed on nothing but manual labor, you're just setting yourself up for failure. And so we we have fun and we do all these fun, silly things um, because, again, they're fun. But mostly we're just trying to bring a customer closer to us. That way, if we build a bond with them and then we scratch their walls, we still got to fix the wall. You know, we got to repair yeah. that. But it's not going to be as bad of, a, of an right. impression on them as, sure. How, how do you go about, so the movers you're getting, so are you looking for people that have never really been in the moving industry to come and work for your company? What are you finding there? Or are you getting guys from other companies? Um, well, are- probably like most moving companies, you're brand new. So there's a, right now we're still not large enough for that tipping point to occur. Meaning sure. when we, when we open in a new market, you have no to. one knows us, you know? And so we're having to start from, you know, first inning every time we open a new location, new, new location right now. So we have, we typically hire ex movers to begin with. We tell them upfront during their orientation what they're getting themselves into. Um, I kind of equate it to a, the baseball world. There's a small like minor league baseball team called the Savannah Bananas. Savannah Bananas. Yep. Yeah, and so they're <laughs> a base. They pitch. They hit. You know all those things a baseball team does, and they hire baseball players. But they're a completely different type of baseball team than. Of course a major league team or whatever, you know? And so that's what we tell people. You're walking into a different type of situation here. Yeah. You're going to pick up couches. You're going to wrap and drive trucks and all those things, you know, but we're also going to expect higher things from you. Now that usually means more tips. That means more hours and more work because of all that. So um, it usually kind of works hand in hand, Uh, like a good, like any moving company that's successful, usually good movers find them. You know, we, we start out with like normal things, help wanted ads, but as we grow, usually people find us. So do you find it's harder? Well, I mean, this is obviously how you've done it since the beginning with, with all the fun things the movers are doing. I wonder, do you find that it's easier to find movers because it's more of a fun work environment or is it harder because they're like, Oh, I don't want to have to do that. Like, I, no, well, how are not, you? it hasn't been real difficult for us. I mean, when I, when I first started in this industry, not that long ago, yep. we hired an industry insider to sort of act as like a consultant to us mm-hmm. just because again, we didn't know anything other than what consumers thought of this industry. Sure. And we had to part ways very quickly because he was adamant that no mover would ever wear the color pink. Right? He's like, all this fun stuff sounds really good, but the guys aren't going to wear pink shirts. And I'm like, well, they're not going to wear pink shirts. They're going to wear wear pink and white striped shirts, <laughs> you know, they're going to be really loud. Um, and they're going to drive pink trucks too. Yeah. No one has ever, ever objected to that. Yeah. yeah. But the industry insider thought we were nuts and we probably are a little nuts, but movers for the most part have not, you know, we've had the occasional person who says, I can't dance or what push ups. That's weird. Um, <laughs> But usually the culture is in place. You know, once yeah. somebody comes in and we said, this is how we roll, then people get it. That's how it works here. And again, the the, the tips, that's... that's Makes a big difference. Yeah. You, you get a big tip after being a little different, then you're going to keep being different. Yeah. It's super neat. So kind of tell me a little bit about the marketing channels you guys are doing. You mentioned earlier, you're doing some pay-per-click. Uh, obviously, you're doing SEO. Um where are you, where are you finding success and where are you not finding success where you're like, ah, that didn't work for us. Um, that's kind of, you know, this is obviously one of those things. A lot of people like to keep it, you know, close secrets. Cause obviously it's what's working for you, but, um, 
if someone was in your shoes and, and, and trying to start or help their own marketing stuff, you know, what are things that you found that, that were good? So, yeah, I don't mind sharing the secrets because at the end of the day, it's, you're going to do two, you're going to do one of two things to make marketing work. You're either going to spend money or spend time. Okay. And if you can spend both, then you probably got a home run of a business, whether sure. it's moving or not. So that's what we do. You know, early on, again, we don't have any traction. People don't know who we are. Pink Zebra is a brand new business with no customer base at all. So we have to do it the hard way. We got to buy our way to the top. And so PPC is a huge mm-hmm. emphasis early on in terms of investment, time, money, capital investment. Yep. Um, obviously, you know, when you're dealing with a, that type of lead, the conversion rates are going to be a little bit lower because you've got a five minute window to make a sell on a ticket that's probably not comparable to other tickets, you know? And sure. so it's, it's, it's not as a, it's not something that we lean our hat on for long-term growth, but that's certainly how we enter a market because you got to pay to play. Now yeah. our real goal, what works for us is just being out in the community, working with what we call these folks, referral agents. So everything Mm -hmm. from realtors being the big one to property managers, to storage facility owners, restoration companies, you know, all all the typical people, you know, we work really hard to build relationships with those folks. We don't call them and say, Hey, we'll give you a hundred dollars if you refer clients. That's, you know, maybe something we end up doing, but that's not how we lead. We just want to start a conversation. The, The conversation we're having right now is the conversation we have with realtors. And usually when we tell our story, the reason why we exist and what we do to disrupt this industry, realtors and others usually want to take a chance on us. And yeah. that's like a snowball. That doesn't happen quickly. The conversations may happen quickly, but the res- the rewards from those conversations may take months to materialize. So sure. we start with heavy investment on the PPC side. We do some direct mail uh, to MLS, and then we lean our, most of our, uh, you know, hard work and future results on just referral based marketing. Like what can we do to get someone to say, Hey, call pink zebra moving. Cause usually when we yep. get that phone call, it's a, it's a slam dunk. Yeah. And that's, you know, it's really interesting too, as far as the, um, you know, realtors and the, I mean, let's just talk about realtors. You know, the majority of good realtors will refer a company like yours because they have built a relationship with you for number one. And number two, they're going to do it because they know you personally and they know that, or the brand personally per se, but they know you're going to take good care of their customers. The last thing a realtor wants to do, money or not, whether you're giving them money or not, most of them are okay without money. They're just doing it because they know you're going to take good care of them because they don't want to refer Pink Zebra moving to, you know, the little husband and wife that just bought a house or a new cup, newlywed couple that just bought a house. Um, and then pink zebra does a terrible job because that not only does that make your company look bad, but that makes the real realtor look terrible. Yeah. Um, like I'm sure realtors refer title companies or agencies. Sure. That's a pretty standard service. Yeah. You know, it's, it's hard to mess it up. You can't screw that up, but you can absolutely screw up a move. Yeah. And that comes back on the realtor because they're the person who said you hired them. So they are hard people to convince but once you convince them and show them what you can do, then you got them for life. Um, and so that's, that's, that's the snowball effect. You know, it just takes, it takes time to earn the first opportunity. And then after that, this, you know, the spigot's running hard, you know, and you so, just continue to do a good job. Yeah. And that's, you know, uh, when we had our moving company and that was one of the things that we would really target on was, was nursing homes was one or retirement homes. Cause you'd get the person there that would refer you to everyone moving in and out. Right. Um, and 99% of the time, never uh, anything financially uh, advantageous for the person referring us. The, what, the key to it was, uh, if we went in there and talked to them, was, you know, obviously we'd tell them all about the company. We do stuff for them. But we say, if there's ever a problem, this is my cell phone number or the sales reps phone or whatever it is. And you call me and I will be out here personally. I will be here to handle it. So you're not, if, if you refer other companies, you, you might not get anywhere, you know? Right. I'm not saying you say that to them, but they, they kind of know if they refer anyone or if, you know, John Smith moves in and he has a terrible move, um, there may be no resolution if it's with another company. 
But if you're referring us, we will take care of those customers. We absolutely will take care of everything. And if there's ever a problem, this is our contact information. And I will be the first one to come out here and handle it for you. And more times than not, that relationship would last five years, 10 years, 15 years, almost forever. And there would be problems sometimes. There would be times when a truck was late. There would be times when um, someone, I'm talking when you're working in a retirement home, uh, someone would complain that we were holding the elevator a little too long, right? Silly things, right? Sure. But we were there to handle it and they knew they could call us and we'd fix it. Um, and them being able to have that control is what allowed them to be happy to refer us rather than people just bringing in their own movers that they have no control over. Um, if that mover does a bad job or is holding up elevators or whatever it is, they can't do anything about it. So, um, so that's super good that you're going after the retirement or the uh, realtors because it's the same thing. Retirements is, a, is another big one. Um, I heard you talk about the restoration companies. We used to do a ton with restoration companies. Um, you want to be that guy that or that company that anytime they get a call for a flood job or a, you know, a smoke job where there's a fire, but not burnt down, but smoke where you got to go in and pack everything up and get it out of the house, that you're the company they call because they know you're going to show up and you're going to handle it and take care of stuff when you, they need it. You, know. you get the right restoration company to partner with you. You can almost build a business just around that one relationship. Yep. It, 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 you could have work every day um, yep. if you wanted it. Yep. And so we used to do a bunch of that. So that's really interesting. What other, so the majority of your business now, is it uh, majority is residential? I'm, I'm it assuming. Is. It's all 95% nope. local uh, residential. Yep. I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll do anything, you know, so sure. if you want to, I mean, as, your, office, as you will. get more franchises, it's going to, it's going to be advantageous to you to, to do long distance. Cause you're going right. to have, uh, you're going to have offices in multiple locations where people are moving from. And so you'll, um, it'll be easy for you to be able to send a driver and just pick up employees from your franchise in the city that they're moving to and stuff like that, which that's true. Which, yeah. Which yeah very, we, we're, we're doing a little bit of that now, again, with 10 locations, it's, you sure. have limited options there, but uh, it's, it has happened. And we certainly believe it will happen more as we grow. That's great. And so um, obviously in the beginning here, you know, you, the majority of the success that's, not success, but the majority of how you've been able to build this company so far is because of your past success with the other company. Um, yeah. You're able, obviously able to financially fund that and then bringing all your knowledge over from the other company. How, how do you feel building this company is so far? You're two and a half years in. Um, how long, let me ask you that first. How long had you had the other company, the cleaning company? 19 years before I sold it. 19 yeah. years. Yeah. So, so you're two and a half years in now into Pink Zebra. How do you feel compared to where you were two and a half years into the, the cleaning business? Well, we're definitely in a better place because we're, one, we weren't as well capitalized. I was totally self-funded early on. Sure. And I guess I'm still self-funded, but it's, it's a different, it's a different yeah. life phase. Uh, you know, so yeah. we, we were living <laughs> paycheck to paycheck, literally back in those early days. In fact, I didn't get a paycheck till my third year that I was open. So we, we only had one location two and a half years into that. We didn't know anything about franchising, really didn't know a whole lot about home services. We were just sort of fumbling and bumbling our way through it. And all of that was a good thing. You know, it worked out and I learned a lot from those failures and mistakes. But here, we don't have to make those same mistakes. We The one thing we don't know as well as someone that's been in the moving industry for 10 plus years is that, you know, but when it comes to franchising and home services and what the consumer feels and what the new business owner feels and goes through, we've been there, done that more than one time, you know? And so we feel really good about all of that. The marketing to marketing is a little different here than it is on the cleaning side. Um, the sales process is a little different. Uh, obviously the, the trade, the work itself is, is a lot different, uh, but everything else is pretty much the same. A new business owner goes through the same you know, worries and fears and anxieties that a new business owner does in, in another industry. Uh, consumers for, for any home service business want to feel better afterwards. You know, they, no one yeah. wants to pay money to someone and go, boy, that was a complete waste of money or man, that sucked or I'm going to write a nasty review. Like, everyone wants those same feelings as a customer. And so 
uh, we feel like that gives us an opportunity to be in a better place for growth. And so far, again, it's been great. I and mean, we've certainly made some mistakes. You know, I can tell you plenty of those. Uh, we're not perfect, but sure. it's also, there's a lot of, a lot of wins too, and a lot of victories that have been present because we've already experienced some of those failures in the past. Yeah. And I think that's what's, you know, obviously your last company is very successful, but I think that's part of what's allowing you guys to go to grow so much and not even talking about the capital, but just the experience, having the experience of knowing when's the right time to start opening other locations. How's the proper way to market the franchise? Um, what's the process of franchising? All, all these different things that you learned the hard way um, with your first company is now able to, to help you go a lot faster and a lot more strategic uh, and growing Pink Zebra um, for sure. the first time you did it, right? <laughs> no good. doubt. I'll, I'll give you a quick example. In Tampa, yeah. Tampa, Florida was our very first two maids in a mop franchise location. Yeah. Wonderful husband, wife, couple who owned it, still own it today. We flew there, said, here's how you do it. Next day we, we left and they said, wait, you're leaving? We're like, yeah, you got this. Here's how you do it. Here's a book that proves it all. And that was obviously not the way to build a business. Sure. It wasn't how you ramp. And so we had to come back and do all these other things and learn from our one day's worth of training is not enough. That sim- sounds like one-on-one stuff, but yeah. it's, it seemed right at the time. And yeah, so know. now we know it's a 90-day pre-open process. We're there. They're here with us for a week in Birmingham. We're there for at least a week with our new franchisees. We're there a lot afterwards too. We're there every 30 days. Uh, we're holding their hands a lot more yeah. now than we were early on at Two Maids because life taught us that, you know? And so, yeah, yeah, we, we made some big blunders along the way, but thankfully sure. we're, we're past a lot of those. Are you a moving company struggling to keep up with customer calls? Let Lion's Den Booking Service handle your overflow, after hours calls, or even the entirety of your sales. As a call center booking service, we're dedicated to helping your business thrive. With years of experience and a commitment to customer satisfaction, we'll make sure your clients receive the best possible service. Trust us to take your business to the next level. Contact Lion's Den Booking Service today. www.lionsdensales.com And in, in a lot of these, and I may be wrong, so, but a lot of these people that are buying the franchise, um, and maybe for both companies, in the past, they may not have a lot of experience running a business. You know, like you had said, they're, you know, yeah. they, they've worked in corporate America, which corporate America is definitely different than, than owning your own business and having to make payroll and having to, you know, all those kind of things. So I think that's where, um, if that's the case, where it's really important and where you guys have seen success because you guys are able to teach them all those things. Um, right. Now, if we, could, if we could find a franchisee who's owned a business, built a business, been successful and wants to do it again, perfect. Right? Yeah. But that's rare. <laughs> you know, what, yeah. what, if, if someone's already been successful in a, in a business in the past, they're probably going to start another business like I have again sure. at some point in their future. Franchisees are first time business owners for the most part, you know, and so mm-hmm. they're used to, working behind a desk. Most aren't, don't even know what blue collar means, you know? So we're, we teach them all the things like most don't know when you hire someone in the blue collar world, that doesn't mean they're actually going to show up for their first day on the job. (laughs) So that is very obvious. And we know that because we, you know, we've all been in this world for a while now, (laughs) but white collar folks think you hire people and they work for five years and you know, sure. you don't have to do anything other than take them to happy hour once a month. Yep. <laughs> yep. It's a big, big change, big difference uh, type of uh, employees and, and workers for sure. Sure. Um, Anna, and you don't have to talk a specific uh, number, but if someone was looking at doing a franchise with you guys, what kind of money usually are they looking at spending or what, uh, you know, what's sure. the start point and where, where's, what's that look like? So it's really, it's a, it's a pretty broad range. It's all based on the size of the market, um, even the value of the trucks, you know, because we require two trucks on day one. So some trucks are, that meet our specs are less than 50,000, others are closer to 100,000. It's really yeah. based on owner's decisions. But the, the quick answer is somewhere between 150 to 250. So 150,000 to 250,000. Um, a lot of that, again, is based on the size. Some markets are smaller than the other markets. And if it's a larger yeah. market, it's going to be more expensive. Sure. And then, you know, the good thing, I guess, what I picked up is is doing a franchise with your company. 
um, you guys try and handle or do handle a lot of the sales process. So you said, you mentioned yeah. you have a call center. So, so they're able to help uh, the owners of the franchise are then in charge of getting trucks out, hiring their movers, uh, making sure that the movers are trained and doing, doing everything that your brand has set up. But then the majority of the sales process, uh, getting people to call in, doing all that stuff is, is, you know, run by, by the franchise. Mm -hmm. We do everything but in-home estimates and sure. some of those. But you schedule those, them, I assume. Right. Yeah. We schedule in-home yep. estimates. We schedule uh, jobs. Uh, we, yep. you know, we, we provide those estimates. We conduct all the marketing that generates those leads. We, we do it all. Now, some people have ideas on how to do things better, you know, and so yep. some people may say, hey, I'm going to do what you said on the lead gen side, but I'm also going to buy a billboard, you know, and so we're like, sure. okay, buy a billboard. Um, yeah. so there, there are other things that people can do, but the majority of what we do is digital based, yeah. uh, a little bit of direct mail, uh, but most of it's 90% of our marketing success comes from just pay-per-click marketing and just knowing right. how to build that campaign, uh, what to do as it, as it evolves and, um, making it as efficient as possible. A lot of people just throw money at it, but that's not usually the, the right recipe for success. Money's important, obviously, but what you do with the data over time is that pay-per-click campaign is growing is really what determines success or not. So we do that all in-house um, and same goes for the sales side. We have call center agents who they're not based here, they're virtual, but we have uh, dedicated agents who answer the calls and uh, we'll do everything but provide support. If the support sure. call enters our system, we'll take it. We'll, but mostly we're just you know, taking messages for our, cut, for our franchisees, but yep. all the sales support is provided by us. Great. Okay. And then as far as, um, so you're in the, the franchisees, when they open in the market, are they typically priced similarity, similarly to, geez, sim, similar, <laughs> similar to the competitors in that market? Are you guys higher? Are you lower? Where, where kind of are you guys at in the market? Yeah, we, so again, we're based in Birmingham. And so we yeah. call that our default pricing. Sure. Uh, this is getting super technical, but hopefully it makes sense. So basically we, uh, we do a couple of different things. One, we do, we go really grassroots and just call local competitors that match up with what we think we're going to look like, you know, the big guys, two men in a truck and so on. And then we use that as a, as a bit of a, a basis. The other You're is not supposed to say to... their name. You're not supposed yeah. to say their name. <laughs> we, I'm i agree yeah and so we we look at cost of living you know and how the, sure. that index factors from birmingham to let's say new jersey and then whatever that factor is combined with what we've seen in the just local search we then use okay. that as a basis and so if birmingham's always default jersey jersey may have a two times factor or one and a half factor or 0.2 yep. factor or whatever you know and so um, that's, that's kind of the research that we, that all happens before you open. And, yep. um, some of it's based locally, uh, on just what's happening there as well. Cause some, even, even right now in the, like the state of Alabama, for instance, we have, um, three locations open for business. Well, what happens in Auburn, Alabama, that's a college town is different than what happens in Birmingham, sure. which is more of a suburban community, you know? So we have to account for that. Yeah. That's interesting. So what examples of rejections have you faced or overcome since you've started this, this new industry, you know, obviously two and a half years ago, the new business, um, ha or have you faced any, or has everything been smooth sailing? For sure. Plenty of, plenty of, <laughs> gosh, we could have a whole show on that, you know? So, I mean, I can give you a, a couple out of the box. Yeah, I mean, I, a couple. Yeah. So, I mean, one is just we believe we're good for the industry. We, we want sure. as many moving company owners to be friends with us as we can possibly connect with. But we also believe we're different and we're creating a spin on this industry. And we assume that that's going to have, you know, some type of domino effect later on and people are going to respond to that. Uh, but there's certainly been a lot of local competitors who don't feel that we're in it together, you know, cause I've always believed both in the cleaning world and now this world that there's plenty of business out there, you know, like who doesn't want a ticket? Yep. Nobody's going to hand over and deliver free customers, you know, but at the same time, I feel like there's plenty of work, you know? So anyway, um, just trying to get local competitors 
to mingle with us and learn together has been a little bit of a challenge because we're the big bad franchise, you know, and so I, I could hope we can change that as we keep growing. The second has just been the obvious thing since we're so new and raw at this industry, uh, we've had to learn everything on the go. Um, and so that's not ideal. You know, you'd rather be able to have all that behind you and then start growing. And so when we talk to a franchise candidate, oftentimes the biggest objection they have is, yeah, you did this before and you're kind of cool and neat and new and I love this industry, but I need, I need to see some time. I need to see some success. I want somebody to be five years old more than instead of five months old. Yeah. Um, and so overcoming that and giving people reasons to um, understand that that risk while it's there is really minimal because whether we move people or clean people's toilets, that part for us is really not the most important thing. How we train someone, how we support someone, how we coach them, how we train a six month old franchise is a lot different than how we train a six year old franchisee. And so we know that we've already been there. And so we, we feel a hundred percent confident in who we are and what we're going to be later on. But for a new franchisee, it sometimes is a little scary. And so we've, we've dealt with that for sure along the way. And that's interesting. And that's one of the things I've found so much too in the moving industry. And it, I feel like it has gotten better over the last couple of years, a few years, but where moving company owners are so tight with all their information, they don't, they don't want to talk right. to them. I mean, we were, it's, and I say it, but you know, we, we had our company J and J Metro and we didn't really talk to our competitors. Like you wouldn't, it's not like other industries where you, where you're, feel comfortable telling them what's working and what's not working because it's like, you're worried they're going to take your stuff. Um, which is so silly because exactly like you said, there's more than enough money out in the, in the, in the United States, the, the world really, um, for everyone, there's more than enough moves. People are always going to be moving. They're building more and more homes every day. Um, there's enough business for everyone. You just need to do, you need to be good at what you do so that you get the moves. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think there's power in a group, you know, but the first, one of the first things we did when we entered the industry, I reached out to um, some folks in our space who are well known in, in the franchise world and said, Hey, we're coming. Uh, it's awesome. You know, we're like, I'd be a, like fraternity brothers, but yeah, they weren't quite as receptive to that. And I was like, well, we lo I love you guys. You guys are awesome. You know, you're a yeah. hundred times bigger than us, you know, so you're always going to be bigger than us for the next several years. And yeah, that's good. But that, they didn't quite it's see one it of the way. interesting things and we've <laughs> seen it and that's why we started doing events because you know it there is so much power in getting 15 20 moving company owners or, or more uh, in a room together which are from all different areas not competing with each other and then it's like everyone's best friends and it's it's funny because um if you take a couple from the same city they they don't want to talk <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So, so that's that's uh, it's interesting and that's neat. Yeah. And I, I think you guys are coming to one. Are you coming to one of ours in November? I think you guys I think got so. Tickets. Yeah, we've got. I, I don't know if I'll be able to make it, but we've got a couple of people in the office where, that are going to be. Where people coming? Great. So that's good. Um, so that's perfect. So uh, now we kind of move into it. It was called the lightning round. So it's just where I got um, six questions I'm going to ask you. It's more not personal questions, but more related to you as a person rather than, you know, the, the moving industry. Sure. So the first one is, uh, what's the best piece of business advice you have ever received? Oh, man, um, put me on the spot. So I'm, <laughs> I'm going to go back in time. Um, I tell this story a lot, I don't, um, but one of my mentors in life was a guy named Fred DeLuca. He, he was the founder of Subway, uh, not the light train, but the Subway sandwich yep. shop. And I met him at a franchise industry conference before we even were a franchise brand at Two Maids. And he taught me so much. But one thing he told me that I still maintain today is that this sounds mean, um, but it's also turned out to be very true. Don't listen to your franchisees. <laughs> that sounds terrible when you yeah. say it out loud. But the main thing he, he was trying to relate to me is franchisees are going to come to you and say, Hey, this needs to be done better. This needs to be done differently. And it's possible that sometimes they're right, but oftentimes what they're trying to do is trade money for time. And so right now we're very proud of our business model and the profit that we generate from it. If you follow our systems, we think you're going to do well. Um, yeah. But you know, some of the stuff that we do, uh, I wouldn't call it manual, but it's, it's 
not automated either. And so maybe they say, hey, let's do this better. And you're like, you know what? I want to make that person happy. So I'm going to do that. Well, all of a sudden you've lost 1% of the margin. And then somebody says, ah, you're doing it the wrong way. We need to do this differently. And now you've lost another 1%. And years pass and all of a sudden you've got this double digit net profit margin business model that's reduced to a single digit profit margin and the whole business model has changed forever. You've made a lot of people happy along the way, but money is the part that's missing. And so at the end, everybody gets mad at you anyway, you know, because they're not making as much as they thought. So I'm trying to stand tall. I did the same thing at Two Maids. Um, Our margins, I want to keep at the levels we're at now and maybe even improve them over time. That means sometimes I have to tell franchisees no. And that's not an easy answer to give people because franchisees have money invested. It's their life savings in some cases. Um, and they believe in it. You know, they, they really believe yeah. that whatever their idea is, is better than what we have. So those conversations are not easy, but at the end of the day, they're meant to make franchisees more money. Yeah. And to do what's best for, for the company as a whole. Right. That totally makes sense. So what's one attribute or characteristic of a successful founder? That's an easy one. So fight, you know, belief, you know, just knowing who you are and, where you're going, you'll end up. You know, most franchise, most founders, most business owners who stand the test of time have had to fight through adversity, have had to fight through really windows of time that seemed like everything was against them and that there was no chance for success. And logic tells you quit, give up, you know, go away from the pain. Yeah. Business owners that are successful fight through it. And always believe even in the worst of times that good, good times are coming. And that is either you got that or you don't, you know, there's very little books that are going to teach you how to feel that way, or even coaching lessons are going to make you uh, feel differently. You either believe in what you're doing or you don't. And if you believe in it more than anyone else, you're probably going to be successful. You could throw a dart on a board um, and whatever the occupation is, if you believe in that, what you're doing there, you're going to be great at it. Yep. That's good. What's uh, your favorite personal productivity tool or habit? Well, mine's less tech, more manual. I love running. I'm a, I don't run as much as I'd like because life, you know, nowadays I got yep. little small kids plus, you know, building a business again, oh. <laughs> but I try to run <laughs> at least three times a week, if, if not more. And during that 30 minutes or whatever I'm running, I get so a self-talk, you know, and so I get so much, I don't even listen to podcasts. I just talk to myself. I'm away from all the normal things that happen in a work day. And I sure. solve problems and also set myself up for success the rest of the day. So running is my thing. And it's not for other people may think that sounds terrible. My wife thinks that's terrible, but I love <laughs> it. And I can't, I look forward to it every time I get to do it. That's great. What's a new crazy business idea you'd love to pursue if, <laughs> You had the time. <laughs> Gosh. Um, so you I'm just started one two and a half years ago. So. I know. I know. So, I mean, I'm a good entrepreneur, so I could do this over and over again. Um, yep. My, my, anything home services, anything home services is for the most part broken right now because nobody does anything about it. And so yep. find a home service industry, figure out, figure out if there's money there, go attack it, figure out what customers hate about it and reverse that, do it right. You got a great business. That's good. Uh, what's an interesting or fun fact about yourself that most people do not know? <laughs> I don't eat lunch. I'm a weirdo. I I am a workaholic. Um, I hate the executive 90 minute lunch. So uh, my lunch <laughs> consists of five minutes. Um, I don't care about the food. I'm not a foodie. So I just want to get it over with and get back to work. So it's it's weird. People think that um, something's wrong with me, but it, it works for me. <laughs> yep. That's good. So what's one of your most important passions outside of work other than family? Oh, well, college football. I'm a, we're in the South, you know, college football reigns king here. I went to UGA. So George is number one in the country right now. And for the last two yep. years as well. And so I'm going to keep riding that wave. <laughs> Go dogs. Yep. So, you're, so you're busy on Saturdays. <laughs> Well, kids and football for sure. Yeah. Yep. Yep. That's good. So Ron, if people want to get a hold of you or learn more information about Pink Zebra, uh, how do they find you? Yeah, really easy. If you're interested in the franchise opportunity as an investment, 
pinkzebramovingfranchise.com is the best place to learn more about us. You'll see what it costs to build one of our franchises from ground up and what we do to train and support you. So pinkzebramovingfranchise.com. If you're a consumer and you just want to know more about us and maybe even book a job with us, pinkzebramoving.com is the easiest way to find us. Perfect. And what states did you say you're currently in? Yeah, so we're mostly in the Southeast. So we're in Colorado, uh, Oklahoma, and then in the Southeast, we're in uh, Georgia, Alabama, Tennessee, and North Carolina. Perfect. Well, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today. And, uh, you know, it was really neat to kind of hear your story and the successes you've had with the previous company and obviously now with Pink Zebra and, you know, two and a half years going, you know, already up to 10 locations is, is absolutely awesome. So thank you very much for being on it. Yeah, I was had a lot of fun talking with you, Jason, and uh, we'll talk again, hopefully. Well, thank you. Well, you have a great rest of the day. We'll talk to you then. Thank you. You too.